Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Tim. Uh, I'm here together with my business partner, JJ. Uh, and we hope to tell you a couple of things about what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Um, and we can, I guess we can do this kind of interactively. So if anyone has questions in between, then just wave. There's a lot of light here, but uh, I, I don't mind uh, uh, an interruption. And I hope you don't either. Um, so. Uh, our company has existed for uh, uh, well over 15 years. We started back in 1998 and um, we started out creating entertainment games and gradually shifted towards uh, a different realm. Beyond creating video games, we've been uh, very uh, hard at work in our country, in the Netherlands, with a couple of other activities. Um, our company is based in an 18th uh, century old prison. It's an old castle with a moat with prison cells in, still intact. Uh, we organized the Global Game Jam there, on the top left corner. Uh, in the top right corner you see a next-gen art event. Uh, the first edition was in 2014. Next-gen art event was an event that uh, basically um, uh, exhibited game art uh, from all over the world uh, next to modern art in a museum. And we had game artists and game directors come over from across the world. Here you see an image of uh, Derek Watts from BioWare um, looking at his own work from Mass Effect that uh, he had never seen printed. And we thought it was very important that we could actually print game art that was uh, part of pre-production uh, instead of just marveling at the end result on a screen. And that to them was also very important. So we, uh, we did that and we also allowed students to have their portfolios checked and uh, to talk to the people that uh, essentially will hire them in the future because we thought we would want to have that perspective, that international perspective in our country as well. In the lower right, lower right corner you see Gameland. Gameland, uh, we have an island uh, uh, to the north of the Netherlands called Ameland that smells, uh, uh, spells like Gameland minus the G. Um, and basically what we do there is we uh, rent about 60 cabins on the island and we put uh, uh, teams of five people in it. We hold a game jam that lasts a week and uh, we uh, get all kinds of people over to uh, um, basically instruct students and game developers alike to work together and create projects and we have like over 60 or 70 projects a year. So that's really cool. In the lower, right, right, uh, lower left corner is me and uh, somebody um, is, is actually the Prime Minister of our country. Uh, I work for Dutch Game Garden, which is a game incubator in the Netherlands. And uh, we try to do our best to get as much uh, uh, help from the government uh, for local and independent games. But the fact of the matter is that what we mostly create is uh, serious games. I'm not, uh, I don't know if you, how much you are aware of that particular part of uh, video game uh, design and development. Uh, what we do is we marry content with theory and uh, we practice game design in it. Uh, we try to solve um, uh, problems in society basically through video games. Um, we think that's very important. Uh, we think that cross-pollination is the most important fact, uh, or most important thing to do in designing video games, basically working together with completely different sectors uh, uh, and different industries. Basically, we see ourselves as a kind of adapter that you click on any, uh, um, any company or any problem and we try to translate it and work it out together with them. And we also try to uh, beat the le uh, leave the beaten path as, uh, as much as we possibly can. So here are a couple of examples of what we are doing and what we did. First thing that I want to start out with is uh, rehabilitation. So we started uh, designing rehabilitation games in, back in 2003, uh, 2004. And uh, that was really a business-to-business -business market. And um, gradually we, we developed that and we moved from that to uh, the business-to-consumer market. And I'll tell you why in a minute. This is a small video that shows work that we've done here in the U.S. Welcome to the Virtual Environment Laboratory in the Military Advanced Training Center. This laboratory is a unique and innovative intervention used to enhance the current rehabilitation program here at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Housed in this 20 by 20 foot space, 
is one of the most state-of-the-art pieces of medical technology available today, the Computer Assisted Rehabilitation Environment, or CARIN system for short. When the MATSI opened, there were only seven other CARIN systems in the world. This is one of the first two CARIN systems to incorporate an instrumented treadmill. The other is at the Center for the Intrepid at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. The system utilizes 12 motion capture cameras in combination with a six degree of freedom motion platform, meaning that the platform can move up, down, right, left, forward, and backward. The platform can also rotate 18 degrees in any direction, giving it a wide range of motion. The platform has a diameter of approximately nine feet and includes a treadmill which is embedded into the top surface. This treadmill is instrumented with four force plates to provide valuable information to the patient's physicians and therapists. To give you an example of how precise the system is, here you can watch me attempt to balance a stick. Now we'll see how the Karen system balances that same stick. As you can plainly see, no problems at all for the Karen system. The two video projectors are used to project virtual scenes onto an 8 foot tall, 120 degree curved screen. An audio surround sound system is utilized to allow for better scene immersion. The system also has numerous safety features which allow the operator to suspend or completely stop the system and simulation. Patients are referred to the Karen by their physicians, therapists, and or prosthetists, and together we establish rehabilitation goals. The majority of referred patients are either amputees, individuals with mild traumatic brain injuries, or both. Based on each individual's goals, different virtual scenes are employed. Scenes which incorporate the treadmill help achieve goals of improved gait and stability. Videos, uh, the video is too long to show here, but uh, you can look it up uh, uh, later. Um, the technology behind it was developed uh, and designed by Motec Medical, a company in, uh, in the Netherlands. And um, basically they asked us, they were, uh, had this perfect academic system uh, with academically designed and built games. Um, but the target audience just didn't like it. They didn't like the games. They did li like the fact that it could rehabilitate using a system like this, but they plainly thought that the, the games sort of sucked, and they did. Um, and there's a funny backstory to it, because in the beginning we started uh, 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 creating video games that had uh, like Vikings slashing each other's up, that was our first attempt at uh, creating like entertainment games and we tried to sell it to Xbox and basically there was a game about dismembering people and then uh, weirdly enough a year later we were trying to mend people that had actually lost their limbs and uh, uh, it was a very intriguing project to do and it was uh, hard to talk to the target audience to see what, what it was that they needed and to come up with a, a good game design that perfectly fit them, it fit their mental state, it fit, fit their personal individual uh, um, uh, bodily harm that they had that they needed to uh, uh, rehabilitate from. But there was a big pro problem with this particular project and that is that embedded in the hardware, as you can plainly see, the, the hardware is extremely expensive. This is not something that you put in a physiotherapy center or uh, in a, at your local doctor's office. So it's, uh, it's way too expensive and uh, we thought we, basically what we should be able to do is take that interface, take that, uh, the knowledge that we uh, received from that interface from working with those patients and see if we can design and develop something for a target audience based on consumer hardware. And that's uh, how we came up with uh, Oath of the Griffin, Griffin Rider. Griffin Rider is a video game specifically for children with uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, or DCD, and, uh, mild uh, brain injuries, and uh, basically this is uh, the um, very basic hardware that was developed in the first place. And uh, we designed and built a game that runs off uh, Connect, but uses the same uh, systems that uh, we used with the Karen system. And uh, what we found out with uh, while we were developing for Karen that. Uh, 
uh, people actually really liked games that had production value. And the largest problem with serious games is that mostly they don't have a lot of production value. Uh, just budgets are always tight. There's always a, a, a very strong emphasis on the academic aspects of it. But when you talk to the target audience, one of the reasons why they like to play it is because it's fun and it's designed well and it should look the part. It should look, look like an actual game because otherwise they feel uh, like they're special in, in the wrong way. So uh, over the course of two and a half uh, to three years, we worked on uh, Griffin Rider. It's a system that, uh, and a game that can be adjusted to every uh, player, uh, just like the Karen system did. And it's uh, a lush environment. It uh, tells the story of a, it's a fairy tale story where the player, the protagonist, uh, basically falls and uh, becomes injured and finds a griffin that's also injured. And together they go on a journey to uh, restore the kingdom. Uh, the queen of the griffins has been captured by goblins. Uh, I should say that this game is designed for children uh, aged six and up. Um, but the funny thing is that when we finished the game, the children were re really, really happy with it. It's being used in physiotherapy centers, rehabilitation centers in our country. Um, um, but then later on, elderly people seem to like it as well. So uh, what we are really proud of is that we get uh, postcards in the mail from elderly people uh, saying, hey, thank you, uh, because of your game, I can actually enjoy walking again. But it's most important that it, it, it actually is a game. And to show you what the end result was, here's a, a, a gameplay video um, that will uh, show uh, the game in, uh, in action. has a, a very uh, cool uh, uh, interface uh, um, and an, an application that parents can use to alter difficulties for their children. Uh, but physiotherapists can also, from a distance, see how a ch child is progressing. And then that way you can actually adapt and adjust uh, levels to uh, suit them. Uh, you also saw the split screen mode, so that children can actually play together with their brothers and sisters or their friends. And uh, we've uh, designed a nifty handicap system that works in such a manner that anybody can basically play with anybody. So that's uh, to children, that's very important. You can also play it in a wheelchair. Um, and uh, we're very, uh, very happy with the end result. So th that, that was one aspect, uh, the rehabilitation. And when we found out that we could actually change the behavior of children, uh, we fought long and hard on, OK, so what's the next project that we're going to do? And um, we started thinking about uh, the chronic diseases that are basically uh, uh, laying waste to our, our youth uh, in, the, in our world. And we fought about obesity. And we also fought about, OK, so how can we address issues around obesity and uh, do obesity prevention uh, by doing it in a non-moralizing manner? Uh, and uh, we fought long and hard, and we fought of um, basically of uh, a cartoon character that would fit the bill. And that particular cartoon character is Garfield. Garfield is a big cat that doesn't like to move, and he loves to eat lasagna. And uh, so that was a perfect way to to basically make it a subject that you could easily talk about. We designed a game called Garfield versus Hot Dog, and um, Garfield versus Hot Dog was designed to be an entertaining game with a message. So that's the most important thing about our video games. We don't want people to notice that it's actually educational. Because you, you probably know the phrase ed edutainment. Does that ring a bell? If children see that, that particular word or they see a product like that, they run away screaming. That's like the effect that you don't want to have. So uh, we uh, really wanted to create something that is uh, uh, fun and engaging and that uh, basically couldn't be recognized as an, uh, as an educational game at all. 
Um, we also had to figure out how we got the right information uh, to pull it off, uh, to how to create uh, game objectives uh, that would match learning objective, uh, that would uh, also work as, a, as a, a game loop. The end result is this. This is the trailer of the game. It will be released in the US soon. Garfield's friends are in trouble. Fast food, soda, no exercise. Everyone's washed out and cranky. The hot dog company has completely taken over town. Now Garfield loves his sleep in lasagna, but this is way too much. And a dog controlling his neighborhood? No way. Explore the culinary habits of people around the globe to complete your comic collection. Play with Garfield's friends to race, cook, eat, jump, walk, shake, and kick your way to victory. Will you help Garfield bring some sense to this dog-eat-dog -dog world? Become our friend and join our ever-growing community. Uh, that, uh, that game was uh, designed together with uh, uh, various universities that contribute to the World Health Organization. And we, uh, together with them, uh, we looked at the, the game's objectives that we wanted to create for children aged 5 to 7, 7 to 9, and 9 to 12. And uh, we thought of a distribution model that would fit that uh, purpose as well. Uh, if we, we knew that if we would probably put it up on the App Store, on Google Play, it would be a hard sell because it would, discovery would be hard. Uh, but uh, we didn't want to build a free-to-play system that would nickel and dime children, especially not with educational content. So uh, we first started working together with a health insurance company in our country, in the Netherlands, and um, together with the educational institutes, uh, we created a pact that would help us to uh, distribute it for free amongst, uh, uh, amongst children and, uh, and their parents. And that worked out really well uh, for us. And we're currently uh, uh, working together with the European Union to uh, get the game uh, uh, published uh, at uh, 23 different member states. Thus, it's very important that we have localized content because the food needs to be food that you recognize and also your, your own environment needs to be represented. So as a company, we are being uh, reimbursed for developing that specific content uh, and sometimes branding it for uh, a health insurance company, for instance. Um, and I should say that our health insurance companies and our health system is way different from the one in the US. Uh, so that gives us a little bit more leeway. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we're going to push that particular bit in the US. But it was an, uh, a very exciting journey uh, to uh, start to, to work together with Jim Davis to get the budget and all the uh, science partners uh, uh, attached to the, uh, to the game. This is a, a gameplay video. For that uh, particular target audience, we needed to design games that fit them. You saw a, a slew of mini games. There's a, 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 a meta game where you basically uh, have a turf war between food trucks, and you have to uh, fight the hot dog company that's trying to take over the streets and sell uh, crappy food. And basically, if you sell enough good food, and you uh, then you can convert his stands and you can start selling what you'd like to sell. And it gives uh, the most simple games, like uh, the Flappy Odie game you saw, uh, is basically uh, uh, a very simple game that will allow children to see what's good food and what's wrong food. Uh, but we always want to have an optimistic message, so we're not never saying that it's actually wrong food. We say that it's better not to eat only fat food, but you'd rather switch it up with having uh, uh, some non-fat food as well. And that's basically the message of the entire game. So we're never moralizing, once again. And uh, we built a game loop that uh, reinstates that, uh, reaffirms that very uh, strong. So we have a city. We have uh, quest givers uh, uh, that uh, basically give out quests that fit, fit you. And uh, we have mini games uh, that gives you uh, currency to convert uh, the food stands later on in the, in, in the block. 
and what I meant with games that fit you is that uh, we're offering several mini games, and if they're too simple for you, you can just ignore them and you can go to the other mini games that you do like because we didn't want to restrict players. Um, so this is basically how the game economy works. Uh, we launched with uh, f uh, five different cities, I think. Yeah, was, we had Beijing in there. We had uh, Venice, Tokyo, Amsterdam, and New York. Uh, plus all the food from all those different regions and all the recipes and so on and so forth. Plus the environments also for the racing games. And uh, this is how uh, the game loop uh, worked. And this is something that we could easily uh, change or switch up to a free-to-play model where we would nickel and dime children, but once again, that's something that we absolutely didn't want to do. Uh, so it's built for children age five and years and up. Budget was 1.4 million. There were no subsidies or grants involved. Basically, we took a long, long, long time to talk to a lot of different people to raise the money. Uh, we got on an airplane and we went to uh, Jim Davis, uh, the original cartoon maker of Garfield, and we said, hey, listen up, uh, we don't have any money, uh, but this is something that we really want to do. If you want to work with us then, uh, and give us your blessing, then uh, we'll work really hard and I'll come back a year later and we'll be able to pull, pull it off. And that we did. One year later, basically, uh, we signed the deal. Um, so it's an ad-free game uh, as well. So the two different ways of publishing, like I said, in the entertainment market. So uh, we basically we do it together with publishers. If we can't find put partners that are suitable for that particular region, then uh, we put it on the App Store uh, for a small amount of money uh, without ads, without uh, all the free-to-play mechanics. And uh, in the serious game market, we look for people in the healthcare domain, we look for regional government, we look for national government, and we find ways to basically publish the game, uh, sometimes with branded content or whatever. But it's a completely different model. Uh, we don't have the disco discoverability problem, uh, plus your game is uh, uh, directly where it needs to be. It can be pushed in schools, it can be used in a lot of different manners. Another thing that we wanted to do after Garfield was uh, uh, something with smart energy and water. Uh, so basically we wanted to do something that uh, how Internet of Things, utilities and gaming can uh, contribute to saving our planet. Uh, for this we uh, designed a game for our nation's largest uh, water, uh, water company. Uh, their name is Vitens. And they have a problem with uh, diminishing peak level load on the water network. So to give you an idea, the largest problem we have in the Netherlands is when uh, the Netherlands actually made the World uh, Soccer Championship. We didn't do that this year and we sucked. Uh, but when that does happen and we're entering the, the finals or the semifinals, the break moment in between is when everybody flushes the toilet. There's a lot of water for the water network and there's a big problem. Um, now, in Holland, we're lucky that all of our country basically consists out of mud. We have mud everywhere. There's everywhere where there's mud and there's sand. We don't have rock. You guys here have rocks, mountains, deserts, whatever. Uh, we only have grass and uh, mud. So if we want to put in new pipes, uh, bigger pipes, to address that particular hardware problem, we can just do that. Uh, I can give you an example where that's, that, that particular thing is an impossibility, for instance, uh, in the city of London. The city of London has a water company called uh, Thames Water Utility. And Thames Water Utility has a very old, leaky Victorian water network. Uh, it's a very old network and th the subway is right above it. And then you have the entire financial grid. Uh, plus it's a, a very busy city, so there's no way that they can just pull it open. They don't have the mud thing. So uh, to them it's a problem because they lose 25 million liters of fresh water, clean water, per day. And the metric system probably works against me with that. I don't know how many gallons that is, but it's a, it's a lot of water. Um, so we wanted to see if we could apply behavioral change in uh, designing a video game, and we came up with something called the Wijk en Water Battle that translates to the water uh, neighborhood battle. And uh, basically we let neighborhoods battle each other to diminish uh, the peak level load on the water network. And uh, the game works like this. It's uh, an intricate system. And the 
top left corner you can see uh, a school with children. Children play the, the game uh, at school. Um, it's a, a platform game that, uh, that you can play on mobile. Uh, and people from the neighborhood actually use an application. They use that application to uh, schedule their water use. They need to make a projection on how much water they're going to use and when they're going to use it. Um, if they actually do that, if the queues work, then the goals for the children change. So it's directly connected to the water net, so there's a real-time connection through smart meters. So instead of you ha having parents banging on their daughters, their teenage daughters, shower doors, come, come on, you have to cut it out, 15 minutes is more than enough. Now we actually have teenage daughters banging on their parents' shower doors because they're saying, cut it out, I'm not getting my level. I can't complete my level because the water level is actually too high, physically. Um, and we did a first pilot. Here you can see how it works in action. So in the top left corner you can see kids playing. They collect trivia. Trivia is being thrown to the app. People in the neighborhood uh, answer those uh, particular questions. It's just generic water information. And, uh, but when they score points, it actually is being thrown back to the school and to the children. They plan their water usage. And uh, then 24 hours later, uh, it checks how the water was being used. And if that works out, children already know because of the game they're playing, but uh, then uh, they add more points and the points being uh, uh, added to what the neighborhood is scoring. And that way you have a loop where children keep playing and the neighborhood keeps planning their action. Uh, so the first pilot, uh, we also had a TV show that we set up uh, together with uh, um, a character in the top left corner. Uh, the response was extremely good. People from the neighborhoods uh, really liked it, so it increased social cohesion by quite a bit. Uh, and also, uh, people actually totally changed their showering and washing routines. Now we've just uh, finished uh, the second pilot uh, uh, with a much larger target audience, and what a water company had hoped that they would reach about half a percent of uh, uh, diminishing the peak level load on the water network, it actually became percentages. And even uh, months after the game not being played anymore, uh, it's still, uh, uh, it, it seems like it's, it, it has a lasting effect. Now the problem of this particular game's design was that it's, it's a, uh, a platform game, so you run out of content at some point in time. So what we're doing next is we're designing games uh, for different target audiences uh, that basically uh, have infinite loops. And that can also be connected to the energy grid. So we're now working together with energy companies and energy and water uh, becomes a powerful combination. This is what we call a uh, uh, smart meter. You probably have them in the US. They're installed in your house. Nobody gives a shit. I mean, it comes up with statistics, and you look at the statistics, and you say, okay, so I save a little water, I'm using this or using that. Um, but if you actually look at it like a Netflix um, subscription model, or um, Xbox Live, or whatever, and you put content on there that actually creates entertainment with water or with electricity it becomes a very powerful tool. So you could create intergenerational bingo between grandparents and their grandchildren uh, based on energy, uh, energy use, and so on and so forth. So that's something that we're currently building out. Uh, we've been asked to uh, work together with uh, our, um, our national government. We're part of a, uh, a research group that's uh, uh, that wants to basically apply these games to for, for the entire nation. So we're looking at how we can roll that out. And we're currently also talking to governments uh, around the world, to uh, England, as I uh, just said, as I mentioned, Australia, Korea, and uh, the US. So uh, one thing that I also wanted to show is uh, the game that we designed to do surgical training, uh, changing the face of game-based learning. Uh, does anyone here know what keyhole surgery is or laparoscopy? Yeah? Okay. Um, for those that don't, this is, uh, this is basically uh, laparoscopy. It's very different from open surgery. So with open surgery, basically you create a large 
gash across the stomach and uh, the surgeon can just look inside um, and uh, take out what needs to be taken out. Uh, but that leaves massive scar tissue, basically because you cut through the muscles and so on, so that you have to rehabilitate for a longer time. It takes a longer time for the wounds to heal. Uh, so laparoscopy has a couple of uh, very, uh, um, very good points to add to that. It just you just create free holes, free small punctures. As you can see, you blow up the belly with CO2 gas. Uh, and these free small holes, uh, tools are being inserted through them. Uh, the one right above or under the na uh, navel, the belly button, is the, the scope. So they use a scope, uh, but it also has the light source in it and two small holes to insert the instruments. And the cool thing about that is that you basically have no scar tissue. You just have three small puncture wounds and you'll be on the beach in, uh, uh, within a month's time. Uh, so that's uh, super cool, but it also has a lot of problems. Does anyone here have uh, <coughs> problems with uh, graphic imagery? Blood? No? Otherwise, please close your eyes for the next uh, minute and a half. Uh, this is a coleostectomy. It's the removal of the gallbladder. We can all do without the gallbladder. Sometimes it uh, starts to... Uh, do nasty stuff to your body and that's when they take it out. This is uh, how they take it out with laparoscopy. In the lower right corner, you can see what the surgeon's actually doing. And the big screen, you can see uh, how they're doing it. Hopefully. No, no video. Okay, I saved you all. Um, but uh, so so this is, uh, this is how it works. Uh, you can see the two hands and... Uh, uh, the tools go in, but what you can also see is that it's very vague, it's very hard to see what someone's doing. And uh, that's the uh, large problem with uh, laparoscopy, uh, because uh, if I skip back two images... Mm, yeah. Okay, so just imagine that my arm is uh, the, the belly. If you would insert a tool, like so, and you would move it to the left, left becomes left, uh, left becomes right, right becomes left, up becomes down, and down becomes up. So it's an inverted system. The other problem is that because the scope goes in the belly and it has a light source, the light source actually shines directly on the thing that you need to operate on. And because the light shines on it directly, you don't have any shadows. The shadows are cast directly behind it. So you have no depth perception, which becomes a problem when you're entering uh, the uh, stomach with a, a coagulation tool that's very hot and that needs to melt the fat and so on. Uh, if you make mo one mistake, you can hurt someone really, really bad. So that's something that you really need to train very thoroughly. The other thing is that you need to do bimanual training. Uh, as you can see, the surgeon is using both his left and his right hand. He might do the cutting with the right hand, but the positioning with the left hand. And the big problem about that is that, uh, well, everybody uh, here has probably tried to write with his left hand if you're right-handed, or the other way around. It's really, really hard. You need to train that a lot. So that's something that needs to be trained as well, besides uh, the other things. Then you have general eye-hand coordination, plus you're watching a screen while you're actually working with your hands uh, in another place. But all these things have a lot of things in common with video games. If you're watching a screen, you have a controller in your hand. Uh, so that's a very, very uh, uh, important parallel. So how do surgeons and surgeons in training train these skills? They do it on simulators like this. This is the Lab Mentor, and the Lab Mentor costs about 500K. There are more inexpensive versions that are 130K, 240K, but they're very, very expensive. Uh, they do a tremendous job. You can uh, train your skill set very well on them. These are just some examples of um, uh, validation reports that uh, prove that it, uh, there's a very good skill transfer when you train these skills on such an expensive simulator. So we were approached by uh, a surgeon, Henk de Kate Hoedemaker, uh, who uh, lives in our country. He's the director of a skills lab, and this is his skills lab, and he thought, well, if it works so well, and I, I'm gonna buy a lot of these simulators, so he spent a couple of million, 
uh, then I'll have all my residents, my surgeons in training, and do a tremendous job and do some training. But this was the end result. Nobody came up. No, nobody showed up. And there are multiple reasons for that, but they're very, they uh, um, are very similar to the problems that we had with these other games, like the rehabilitation games. And basically, these are the frame, three main reasons. The thing is not available because they're expensive. They're in the skills lab, so it's very hard to go there and train because you need to study all day. Then you need to have the time to do it, and you have to uh, actually uh, do it if the thing is working, but they're very often uh, out of order. They very, have very expensive contracts that, will, uh, uh, that you have to pay to keep them up and running. But the fact of the matter is that people just find them very, very boring because these are very menial tasks uh, that, you, uh, that you do on them. And even though they look very realistic to the layman's eye, uh, they're not very realistic once you have actually worked with tissue. So to combat all these problems, we designed this particular game. It's a game called Underground. It doesn't remotely look like laparoscopic surgery. We asked these surgeons, we asked them, why are we actually doing things with medical context? Why are we removing gallbladders? <clears throat> the only thing that we actually need to train are these five basic skills, and we can do that with anything. So is it a problem if we come up with a creative way, if we tell a creative story and create an actual game? instead of assimilation. They needed to think about it, but eventually uh, that worked out. So this is underground. Uh, in the top left corner you see Dad. Dad runs a mining uh, company on, a, on an alien planet. And um, uh, he also has a small daughter, and his daughter needs to study a lot, but uh, his daughter uh, doesn't study a lot. So he takes one of the robots uh, that works in the mine and basically uh, makes it a butler for the little girl, and uh, the butler needs to look after her and make sure that she does her homework. But the butler, uh, droid, and the girl really like to dance the tango, so they're just dancing tango, and dad finds out that she's not doing her homework and sent the, sends the robot back the mine shaft, and uh, the little girl pursues the robot to save her little friend. It actually came out for the Nintendo Wii U, so it was published, you can find it on the Nintendo uh, Wii U eShop. And we uh, did that for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is we wanted to build it once again on consumer-grade electronics. We wanted everybody to be able to do skill training. We wanted to address the main problem of people having to go to uh, the skills lab. We wanted to eradicate that problem. We wanted people to be able to play it at home. Uh, because these residents, uh, surgeons in training, they were already playing video games at home, so why not create an actual video game? So then uh, we needed to uh, combat a couple of the problems that we had in terms of controls, so we designed this thing, and we brought it with us. That's our controller. It's a dedicated controller, as far as I know, it's the only dedicated controller that came out for the Nintendo Wii U. Uh, we utilized the Wii remotes for infrared vision, to uh, mark our position, and we utilize nunchucks for analog grip function uh, because uh, the controllers uh, usually have a scissor-like function, uh, the instruments for laparoscopy. Uh, we basically hacked the sensor bar because the sensor bar wasn't very helpful to us, so we created our own. And we made sure that it actually looked like a Nintendo-esque device, uh, but the most important thing was that we wanted it to, to be a game-like device. So I brought the box with me, or we brought the box with us, that doesn't look like surgery, right? That looks like something you find in a toy store. Uh, and that was the reasoning behind it, because now we could actually use it to um, distribute it for a very low low price instead of these uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, trainers. And when it came to game design, we could put all that context in designing a very beautiful game world. Um, so you're actually you're, you're playing Swank. Swank is uh, the robot's code name, and he's uh, flying a robot vessel, a mining vessel, that has two very strong arms, uh, and you can fit it, outfit it with welders, with drillers, and so on and so forth. And you have to save these robots, and you have to clear them to the exit. So in terms of gameplay, it's like a combination between Lemmings, The Incredible Machine, and Pikmin, some of our favorite games. Nothing to do with surgery. We're saving robots. 
um, we had to make sure that every aspect of the puzzle space, of the game space, was ab about as big as an abdominal section, because that's the, the room, the amount of room, the space that surgeons needed to be able to maneuver in. Uh, we wanted to create a colorful world, but we had the problem with the lighting. We couldn't use shadows, so we designed, uh, we put a lot of time and effort to create a b beautiful world that would have lighting, but didn't have shadows. Uh, uh, casting in the wrong directions. So we built and designed uh, each level painstakingly so that we could actually pull that off. And the other thing that we wanted to do is for laparoscopy training, um, uh, a lot of surgeons in training uh, do the FLS test, the Fundamentals of Laparoscopic Surgery, set by the SAGES, which is an institute of, uh, of educational uh, uh, guidelines that creates educational guidelines for uh, laparoscopic surgery. We wanted someone to be able to play our game, which takes about 12 hours, and be able to pull off an FLS test and succeed in it. Because that way we could create a curriculum that only lasts 12 hours, and it would solve the problem. Uh, so we built all this, we actually have cutscenes, we have an orchestral soundtrack, it's every, we have boss fights, and the boss fights basically test your knowledge in, in terms of skill training. Uh, this is uh, the ice world, the, the, one of the first worlds, and here's an example of one of the later game worlds, the jungle world. We have these tongue-like creatures that try to cr grab your robots and try to grab your controller, and you need to grab them with one hand and cut them with the other hand, so it does all the bimanual training as well. We basically translated everything to game objectives, as we did with the Garfield game and so forth. We've worked on it for five years. We started out on the original Nintendo Wii. We had a very different controller. Uh, with the Nintendo Wii, we mostly used the motion sensing bit uh, 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 to do the translation of the tools, but we found out that it would sink too late and it, uh, the control started to drift. So eventually we chose for just using the infrared, which was good enough. And uh, we felt confident uh, about our game, but we needed to have it validated. So first there were a lot of internal studies done by hospitals that we did know. And then we released it into, wor into the world to see what would happen, what other groups, research groups would think of it. Here you can see something that we build a specific level. level. This is a, a, a test that people need to do. You have the Cobra rope test. This is a test for surgeons. And this is what they call the pack transfer test. And basically, it's, it tests movement and movement speed. Um, and um, yeah, the, uh, we had our game running it, and uh, the pack transfer running it. And the effects were very positive. So uh, can you see this in the back? Is it, is it light enough? So, down below you see the total score on the FLS pack transfer test in seconds, and to the left you see the total score on the Wii laparoscopic, uh, Wii laparoscopy game in seconds. And the green dots are uh, experts, and the red dots are novices. As you can see, you can see that there's one novice who clearly missed their calling. Should have been a surgeon. <laughs> is beating the surgeon, hands down. Um, but you can see, this, this, this was instantaneous proof. And we traveled the world to medical conferences uh, very much different from the GDCs that we attend. And uh, you would have all these, these younger surgeons, they would love it, right? But then there would be elder surgeons and they would be like, uh, what are you doing here with a video game? I don't. And there was this one guy, I'm not naming names, but he's a very important surgeon. He um, um, figured out a lot of different uh, ways to pull off operations, and he, he was a, a cocky, cocky guy. And all the young guys were playing it, and uh, he was like standing there with his co-workers laughing at our video game. And uh, we were a bit bothered by it, so I asked him, why, why don't you just step up? Why don't you play the video game? I, I don't like playing video games. Video games suck, and I suck at video games. And then we knew we had him. And then we said, but you're good at surgery, right? And then his God complex kicked in. He was like, I'm the, I'm the best surgeon. I, I did this, I did that. And uh, OK, so why didn't you play the game? Does it, did it in one. Had the best high score of the lot. And then he was like going to his co-workers. I got this really cool game. Check out the game. 
And, uh, but, but that's instant validation right there. And uh, later on, uh, a lot of stuff was published in National Endoscopy, American Journal for Surgery. Uh, Stanford wrote about it. Um, we just f had a receipt. Uh, uh, we received a, a, a report just about an hour ago from a, a place in Ireland that has uh, uh, tested it. And the, the results are really good. So people like it. They complete the game. And after they've done, completed the game, they can actually complete the FLS test. And this is the trailer for it. Peggy 7. I'm glad to say that there is not another surgical project or product that has a trailer like that. Uh, it was picked up by a lot of media as well. If I don't know if you have Netflix, but if you have Netflix, then uh, you can look up uh, Bill Nye Saves the World uh, in the first uh, on uh, the first uh, uh, season. Episode seven is called Games: uh, uh, No Cheat Codes for Reality. It's all about the type of games that we create as a company, and we're featured very heavily in that. About 15 minutes of that is about the project. Um, and the funny thing is, this is really true. <laughs> so the harder I practice, the luckier I get. It's a good, uh, um, good uh, uh, piece of narrative, because a lot of people say, why did you need to, to practice? I'm already good at my skills. You know, I'm a surgeon. I'm good at my skills. I, I studied for it. but. As you can see from golf, uh, you, uh, it, the harder you practice, uh, the more luck you seem to have. 